All right, let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to preach. I pray, Lord, that you bless your word in our hearts. Help us to assimilate your words. Help us not just to be hearers, but also doers of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 1, we're in Psalm 127. Verse 1, the Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it, but in vain. The title of the sermon this morning is Except the Lord Build the House. Except the Lord Build the House. Now, just like the church, the house I'm referring to is not the physical building of your house, but I'm referring to our families. Your family, uh, every man here, your family, what that is the house that except the Lord build. That's what I want to focus on this sermon. Now, no matter how many TED Talks you listen to, no matter how many books you read, the seven uh, habits of highly effective families, or raising good humans, or I mean, I'm just listening to any family book out there, without involving God, you're building your house in vain. The house has been built in vain. You're just wasting your labor. You're wasting your time. It's all vanity. And involving God in your family is not just asking his opinions and then ignoring his opinions. Or asking about what God thinks about this and what he commands and ignoring it. It is following his lead as the head of your house. Because God is the head of the man. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So God is the head of the house, because the man is the head of his wife, and Christ is his head. So his commands are not just opinions. His commands are not just preferences. Yes, you can proceed without the Lord, without involving God, and just build your house. He doesn't say, oh, if you build your house without the Lord, you won't build a house. He just says it's vanity. You're building vanity. So if you proceed without God, then you're on a path to destruction. It's like a house built upon the sand, as Jesus was explaining in the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount. So how does your house start? It starts with your marriage. The building of your house starts with the, with the building of your marriage. Marriage is an institution of God, is an establishment of God. It is to be, it's set up by God, set up by the word of God, and it only works the way that God says it works. That's the only way it works. If you want to do marriage outside of God, that is also vanity. It should not uh, be viewed as an opportunity to just satisfy the desires of the flesh. Because the Bible says, oh, it's better to marry than to burn. Now, there's a fine line between lust and love. You say, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting married because, you know, I'm born in a lot, so I just want to get married. That should not just be the reason you get married. It should not be the only reason. Because then it becomes lust and not love, and therefore not built on love. Many people get into marriage and thinking is, uh, is love, but is lust, and they use that Bible verse. Oh, it's better to uh, marry than to burn. So, it should not just be an opportunity to improve your social status. You know, remove reproach from your life, especially women. Oh, my age mates are getting married at this time. Or oh, I finished everything. The next step is to get married. Uh, you know, or oh, men, you know, I just want to be addressed as a father. I want to, you know, get to that social status quo of, you know, my peers and my colleagues. Or some people just get married to go into ministry. You know, I, I want to be a pastor. That's, that's my goal. So, you know, next step now is just, you know, get married. Uh, or, you know, you want to better your finances, right? Best tax rates, because, you know, married people is foul together. <laughs> you get the best tax rates, more money back for your children. Uh, you know, you want to maximize your potential, as it's were. You know, two heads are better than one. Now, don't misunderstand me. All these things I'm saying, if you notice, I'm listing the positives of being married. Right? <laughs> there are no negatives there. All these things are good. These are reasons to get married. But you cannot outsmart God. You know, just getting married because you want all these things. You know, I just want all these things. And you don't involve God. You don't want to do God's way. You don't want to obey God. It's just, I like all these benefits. I like all these positives. You know, I like my children to do this. And I want this. And I want that house. And I want, so, I'm going to get married. But I'm not respecting God, I don't care about his word, then it is vanity. That's why you're building your house. It might look like your neighbor's house, but it's on the sand. It's going to wash away. You're building your house, uh, trying to copy what is on the outside of your neighbor's house, but you don't know what is on the inside. You don't know what is between inside the walls. You don't know the wiring of his house. Your house will catch fire, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm describing, you know, how to build a house physically, but that applies spiritually. You just 
put in drywall and building a house without the structure there. That's not involving the Lord. So what do I mean? You're looking for the most beautiful woman to satisfy your lust. Oh, I'm burning, so I just want the most beautiful woman. The Bible says favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So, I want to get married because of the, I'm burning and lost. Then I'm looking for the woman that's satisfied and lost. You know, it's just beauty. It's just, that is when you're, you're building without the Lord. You're not following the, the rules of God. You're not following the wisdom of the word of God. Or you're just getting married because it's the next step. You know, I want to father a child. I want to beget a child. You know, fathering a child is different from being a father. It's easy for any man to father a child. That is not the difficult part. The difficult part is being the father, <laughs> right? So, or you're going for the second child, or even going for the tenth child because of ministry. You know, you want to meet the qualifier. You see, I have, you know, ten children. So, don't I like to look at the pastor? You know, <laughs> but you're missing the whole point. Are you prepared for the work, right? Are you prepared for the work? See, you want to be a pastor, it, you go about life, living it step by step, precept upon precept, uh, little here, little there. So you live your life, you serve in the church, you uh, get married. As you not, oh, I'm just getting married because I want to be a pastor. Then you don't care about your wife. You don't care about the life that you're getting into. You don't care about the covenant of marriage, right? You don't care about the institution that God set up. It's because you want something else. No, it's about your life. Adam was not needed companionship. Right? And that's why God made Eve for him. And that's how most of us are. Now, some of us could be as Paul that, you know, could do the work on his own and we don't need companionship. But most of us are like that. So don't just get into marriage for ulterior motives, albeit even if it is positive. It's not wrong if you have already done this and you're inside the marriage, then in fact we'll get to that. But I'm saying for those that are not married, that these are not the reasons. Oh, I just want to be a pastor, so I need to get married at 20 years old, so that by you know 22 I have the second child, so 23 I can be ordained. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, just trying to check boxes, then that is wrong. You have to be prepared for the work. Then when you get to the position, then you will see the call to be answered. Then you will desire the office of a bishop, and then you can be a bishop. Right? As the Bible says. So getting married for a better tax rate or large stimulus money? Come on, guys. <laughs> you know, like giving out stimulus, you're like, I just have one kid. Maybe, maybe we should go for others. You know, in case Biden, you know, gives us another stimulus check. That is that is wrong. Any decision that is made solely because of money, that is affected by money, or money is the main factor, most of the time, if not hundred percent of the time, it is a wrong decision. Money should not be the decision maker in your house, but the tool to carry out godly decisions. You know, so what is a godly decision for your situation? That is what you should be asking yourself, and that should be the question. Then money should only maybe limit the magnitude or the greatness or the effectiveness of that decision. So don't say, oh, because I have money, or, or I, uh, because I don't have money, I cannot do this. Right? Oh, I don't have money so I cannot homeschool. Or I don't have money because I... That means there's something else that is the problem. It's not because of the money. It's something that's an underlying issue. Over to Psalm 37, Psalm 37 verse 23. So, when money is the main factor, you cannot carry out the godly decisions without money. Because you're, you're, being, you're limiting yourself or you're looking through the lens of mammon, not the lens of the word of God. So. Something else is wrong upstream. Something else is an underlying problem. Not that money is the problem. Oh, I don't have money to homeschool my children because we need two incomes. Something else is the problem. <laughs> it's not the money that is the problem. It is something else. Now, you might not be able to homeschool your children as somebody else is homeschooling their children, homeschooling their children because uh, we should not compare ourselves with ourselves. But you can obey what God said you should do if you cut out expenses or other types of lifestyle and prioritize how to build your house because it's the Lord that is building your house, not your own wisdom. So, uh, when there's an underlying issue, then you are in bondage to money, you're in bondage to mammon because now mammon is preventing you from doing what God tells you to do. So, what is controlling you? The word of God or mammon? 
Money is controlling you. Psalm 37 verse 23, the Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not, utterly he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I'm not saying there's no righteous man that will be ever fired from his job. He will, he will fall. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. God will uphold him. So you say, oh, but I have money problems right now. God is going to uphold you. Don't let money rule your life. So I believe the Bible, the, the, the psalmist, I believe it's David, said, I've been young and I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging bread. So he said, I'm afraid. But no, forget about no, no, forget about the things that uh, are necessary, necessary for life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Because it's except the Lord build the house. Your labor is in vain. Oh, I'm going, working two jobs. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Or oh, because I need money, then you're not building your house. How God wants you to build your house. So, and, and I'm not digressing in finances or money, but it's very important. Because many people, many people's houses are being run by money. Money is not runs the house. So it's depends on your budget, depends on what's in your account, then your house is being run by that. But it's except the Lord build the house. So your marriage should be according to the precepts of the Lord. Now for the unmarried, marry a born again Christian. That is God's only requirement. Now that shouldn't be your only requirement, but that's God's only requirement, you know, that uh, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Marriage is, if there's anything like yoking, that's what marriage is. I mean, you're completely yoked for life. <laughs> no, no, no divorce, nothing. You're living with that person. So that is the real meaning of yoking. If there's nothing else that yokes somebody else up, than marriage, more than marriage, I should say. So, uh, don't be a nickel to don't believe us. Amongst many other Bible verses, that one is very clear and uh, simple and straightforward, uh, that you should marry a believer. Don't live in fornication. Still talking to the married, because to be married is adultery. Because your mind says, I'm in mean, fornication, I'm not your marriage, so I'm not destroying my house. You are already destroying your house before you start building it. The, the words are already rusting before you started using them. Every, the, the cement it has mixed with water is stone. It cannot be used again. So your drywall is messed up with water. Like you're messing your house up before building it, before you, it even starts. And to the married, living in adultery, what does the Bible say? Hebrews 13 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but homeowners and adulterers, God will judge. So God is going to bring down judgment on your house. Because except the Lord build the house, they live in vain that build it. So this includes, you say, oh, I'm not living in adultery, but you're lusting after another woman in your heart. And it goes with the females too, or the women too, and wives. But just I focus on the men. So you must have done another woman in your heart. You know, I'm just window shopping. <laughs> window shopping to your wife. <laughs> Look at your own wife. Oh, I'm just admiring the creation of God. <laughs> yeah, these, these, these are lines I've heard in the world. Oh, I'm just, you know, God created this, so oh, I cannot admire the creation of God. No, no, no. Admire your wife. That's God's own creation. That's what you're supposed to admire. Her breast should satisfy you. Her bosom, all of that. So, admire your own wife. No need shopping online too. Open to First Corinthians chapter seven. See, I'm just it's just online because these days no one goes window shopping in the stores. <laughs> these days it's online, and you know what I mean. Uh, it's just innocent. I'm just I'm just looking. You're sinning against your own body too. You are destroying your marriage. What are you doing? You are defiling the bed. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Check this. The wife had not power, power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. Before ye not, uh, before ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan, te that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So, when 
you have no power over your own body and you're shopping online i'm talking about pornography in case you don't get it so with pornography you cannot eat your cake and have it in fact i would say eat your cake and have it it looks like it's the same you cannot eat beef jerky and now i have your steak you know your flaming on right you're selling the beef jerky and i'm looking for a good comparison so at the end you end up defrauding your wife you end up defrauding your spouse because your spouse is ready and wants it, you're like, oh, no, I've already eaten. <laughs> but you will not tell her that, and you will not tell him that, right? Because you're defrauding yourself, and you don't have power over your own body. Ask your spouse, can I go and shop online? Can I, can I do something? Will she agree? She has power over your own body. That is a sin against your body. You see what I mean? So uh, it, she will not agree, your spouse will not agree, and the same goes for your mind. Because you're destroying your house before you will start building your house. Your house is being destroyed. So I'm talking to you now, I'm talking to your mind. This is how to build your house. Except the Lord build a house, the labor of vain that build it. What is the place of children? Your children are not part of your marriage, but they are a part of your house. You should always know that distinction. They are part of your house while they are under your roof. When they are no longer under your roof, they are not a part of your house. <laughs> So they have their own house, they have their own house to build, and now she needs father and mother, as the Bible says. So what are children? Children are the increase of your house, not the physical size of your house, because it doesn't matter what size your house is. The increase of your house is your children. It's not the amount of money you have in your bank that increases your house. Oh yeah, I have more money, so now my... No, children are the increase. Children are the blessings that money cannot buy, right? You say, oh, but in vitro, I can buy children. In which you are still by the mercies of God. By the way, that is not even the ideal. And I don't want to go into a rabbit trail. I want to stick with the ideals uh, for the most part. If not, if I go into a rabbit trail, there are so many scenarios, so many examples that you know, I'll give my opinions on. But I'll just stick with the idea. The Bible says, open to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. In our Bible reading there, in Psalm 127, verse 3, the Bible says, No children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of, his, of the womb is his reward. So children are blessings from God. They are the increase of the man's house, of the, of the man's house yes. And um, they are the heritage of the Lord. So they are not part of your marriage. They are God's own, your, as it were, caretakers. You say, oh, but I'm the one that gave birth to the child. So I'm the father, I'm everything. Let, let me pose this question to you. And even the Bible says that a servant that is raised from childhood or from youth, like a child, will at the end be the child. Right? Will be as a child. To the, to the man. If you didn't give birth to the person, right, and you adopt a child as a baby, right, that child is going to know you as father, as father, as your parents. And that child has to obey what the Bible says to the parents, honor thy father and thy mother. Their father and their mother is going to raise them. <laughs> so you can say, oh no, you don't you biologically, you don't give birth to me biologically, so I have no uh, duty to you according to the word of God. That is wrong. So it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm the one I gave birth, so I own the child, anything I want. No, no, it's anything God wants. Because you're a caretaker of that child. Just God did it in such a way that no one else can take care of that child. So you have the blessing of taking care of that child. And because God wants to bless the child, you're a channel of blessing for that child. God is going to increase you to bless that child. God is going to give you what you need to take care of that child. So God is blessing you by giving you that child. Do you understand? So, and nobody in this world can take the child from you while you're able and capable of taking care of the child. Right? Nobody in this world because you're the biological parent. Now, you can get that, in, as I said, there are, other, there are exceptions to all this. You can adopt, you can do that, then nobody can take it from you according to the document signed. All right, let's move on. Look at Psalm 112. I told you to open there. Verse 1, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endure it forever. Children are the blessings and the increase of your house. You saw that God is talking about wealth here. Yeah, wealth is going to increase my house. See, wealth is the crown of the wise. And if you look at the verse before, I think it's Psalm 1110, it says, uh, the, fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And wealth 
is the crown of the right. So you continue in fear of the Lord, you continue going, obeying the Lord, then God is going to bless you. Even with riches. Uh, so children are not the focal point of the house. There are many houses that children have taken the place of God. Children are the focal point. That is God's position. You know, the houses that the children keep the family together. Without the children, they would have separated. They would have divorced. So what is supposed to be keeping the family together? Love. The, the covenant you made. The understanding of what you got into. God should be keeping you together. Right? But children have taken that place. And so it's just because of the children. You know, some parents have moved, sorry, some parents are moved by every urge of their children. Every little thing the child wants, the whole house is moved. <laughs> right? Uh, the, even the temperature. Right? Oh, I'm cold. Increase temperature to heat. Oh, I'm co- hot. Like, every little thing. <laughs> right? Uh, their way of life is governed by the children. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. There are some things that should be governed by the children, like the size of your car. Hello? The law says that every child, what age? I think it's below a certain age, should wear seat belts, and some cannot even sit in front until a certain age. You know, car seats, all of that. Oh, yes, it's governed by children because of the laws of the land, and that is because of the laws of the land. And we're supposed to obey the laws, right? Submit to the ordinances. When I grew up, if I grew this way, in America, <laughs> I have colleagues right now that told me that they rode in the back of the pickup truck as children. Mm-hmm. There are like six of them. <laughs> and the, the four boys were at the back of the pickup truck and the car was just going. High speed. Okay. That was America. <laughs> so I don't even have to go back to Africa or where I grew up. Here, it's just that the laws change and you have to... So back then, when you say, oh, that's wrong, you know, anything you find yourself, you know, as long as it's smart, as long as you can it works, fine. But if there are laws against it, then you have to obey the laws. So that's how the house is affected by your children. But there are some things that go way overboard, even right now. For example, the physical home address. You know, oh, I'm moving to this place because of my children. That is wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to move to that place. Now, I'm saying it's the children that are running the house instead of God. You say, but the place is safe. It's a good school district. That already tells me where your mind is. So you think of public school. Oh, it's not because of the school. It's because of the safe place. You know, it's a safe neighborhood. Wait, are you going to a safe neighborhood just because of your children? How about your wife? <laughs> How about yourself? No one live in a safe neighborhood? So if you have children, you don't live in the ghetto? It's a question. But if they're run by their children, it's, it's a good thing to live in a safe neighborhood. Don't get me wrong. If you have the ability, please move to a safe neighborhood where you can leave your phone door open and your screen door. The moment that you go so early, and that's all, yeah, the doors are open. <laughs> In theory, it's like, you open one door, open another door. <laughs> it's like, who is that? <laughs> the other house is, is when you knock at the door, that they come and close their door. <laughs> So you know what I mean about you're living in? <laughs> Where the garage doors are all open. I mean, you're taking a walk down the neighborhood and everyone's garage doors are open. It's like, <laughs> what's going on here? All their cars, everything showing. And we're like, why are you, what's pastor, what's wrong with that? God bless you. There's nothing is wrong with that. You're blessed. That's a blessing. <laughs> that you're not thinking anything is wrong with that. But <laughs> where I come from, <laughs> you're not leaving your stuff open. You're going to be taken. <laughs> Even uh, I went to school in uh, Philadelphia, Temple, and do you know how many times they, they jacked my car, stole everything? I didn't leave anything in my car that's valuable. I lock everything, close it, close the doors. Even though I'm living in a safe neighborhood where people leave their windows down, <laughs> when I park my convertible, I make sure I close it, no matter where I live. Because <laughs> I just grew up, and I'm digressing and have a lot of, I grew up um, understanding that security matters. Uh, security is a very uh, big thing. So, you're not only moving to a safe neighborhood just because of your children, you're moving to a safe ne- neighborhood because it is good and you can afford it. It is good. You want to be safe, quiet, that's the life you want to live, uh, peace with all men, right? <laughs> so that you can serve the Lord. So that you're not afraid to go out of your house, go so many and live a healthy life and all of that. So don't just say it's because of, you should have moved there already before marriage. Or if you can afford it. Then as you can afford it, you move there. Not, oh, just because of my children, but because of life. So people mask it and say, oh, it's because of my children. And the children are living in the house. For example, church attendance. Oh, my, ch- my child was coughing this morning. 
It's like, that's it? Oh, you just eat. My child is so tired. Or oh, it's my child's bedtime. So we can't attend church past 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. We can't be outside the house by 6 o'clock. One day affecting of the bedtime should not affect the child's life. In fact, the spiritual is more important. <laughs> the spiritual is more important. But the children are running the house. They're making them not go to church. So unless the, it's a contagious disease, right? If it's just tiredness, they are, you can just lie down somewhere in the baby's room, like mother baby room. Right? Because the child will grow up understanding that I have to go to church. See, when I was younger, I was very mis- mischievous, right? And I said mischievous, but <laughs> I'm very mischievous. And I knew how to control my mom. And if my mom is listening to this, she already knows this, they've told her. All right, I knew how to control my mom. Anytime I didn't want to go to school, I fall sick. I knew I fall sick. I did that in, when I was older too, in boarding school. Anytime I didn't want to work, I just fell sick. I pretended as if I had asthma. So I knew all of these things. I, I can act like that, and I survive, and I get away with a lot of things. So children, are, they think they're smart. And that's why I get, catch my children every time. But they think they're smart, <laughs> and they try to get away with it if they don't feel like going to church. I'm not, I'm not feeling fine, I'm sick. Um, if you're always moved by every way, they're gonna keep doing it to get worse. Right? And it's become a lifestyle. And they know that they can get out of church just because they say they are sick or they are hungry or something. But if they do it the first time they still go to church, they do it the second time they still go to church, you know, they just they just give up. <laughs> There's no need telling mommy I'm sick. I'm just going, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Don't stop saying it. My children don't come and tell me they're sick. No, children has tried it a few times. That's, you know, they all get to an age where they understand. <laughs> So she said, "Get into that age," and she tried a few times to get into the car. <laughs> it's not even a question. You can walk it. Why don't you carry her into the car? Just get into the car, right? No, she doesn't say that anymore. It's not. Oh, I feel like no. She doesn't say. How do you think? You know, you think my kids don't fall sick? <laughs> oh, your pastor, pastor's family. Pastor doesn't fall sick. His wife doesn't fall sick. Nobody falls sick in pastor's family. We just have the anointing of healing and all of that. <laughs> We're just like every other family. They all fall sick. <laughs> but we also come to church because it's not a question unless I need to rush them to the emergency. And I tell them, can you wait after church? We we'll go. That's happened before. <laughs> after church, we we'll go. So you just have to manage. When I was growing up. When I hurt myself, I, tr- I hide it from my parents. They're like, why do you hide it? Because the first thing my parents would do is to spank me for hurting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you hurt yourself? Why are you too careful? They spank me a bit of that, then the way they treat it, oh. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. They just think I am being on alcohol or something, and just, they don't care. <laughs> it's like I'm shouting and dying. <laughs> So first off, I try not to hurt myself. And second off, second off, I try to keep it. I try treating myself. Everything. It, it has. It's rough. So kids can survive. We're just spoiling them, and we're letting our house be run by children. And I'm spending so much time on children. We have a lot of little children in this church. So don't let your house be run by children. They're so winning. Oh, I can't go so winning because of my children are here. I still put them there and go so winning. Or leave the children to your wife. One of you in the house should be going so winning. That should be the man. Your children should not be an excuse. Oh, but they have a sports game on Saturday. What, what is more important? Right. Except the Lord build the house. Right. You know, I've been thinking... You know, my kids are going to be tall, they're going to play this, play that. You know, either in school, they probably get scholarships, you know, all of that, play sports. But you know, if they play sports, when do you think that happens? Sundays? Mm-hmm. When does it happen? Saturdays? So I'm not, never going to watch their games? Because I'm going to be here in the pastor. <laughs> so it's useless. But when it, sometimes they have sport activities, they'll see my kids, they're like, oh, they should sign up for this, they'll give me all, they should sign up, they, 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 they look very athletic and stuff. I can't sign up for all those things because I don't have time to attend them. They don't have the time to attend them. So the things, the sacrifices you make because it's the Lord that's building the house, not your wisdom. You see, that this will assure their future. They don't control the house. The Lord is the one that builds the house. So know the place of your children. Let's look at biblical rules. 
the ways of a husband. He's the head of the house. Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Because of time, I'll go fast. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Open to First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. I don't know it's hot here. Is it only me? You guys hot? Uh, okay, so I guess it's only me. So if you're hot, if you're cold, if you're lukewarm, lukewarm, <laughs> and lukewarm, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, um, what was I saying? So yeah, the husband is the head of the house as Christ is the head of the church. And in everything, as the church is subject to Christ in everything, so the wife should be. Uh, therefore, the man is the, the ruler of his house. Even uh, this law, Jesus did not just, oh, sorry, Paul did not just say this for the first time. It has been from the beginning. In Genesis 3.16, unto the woman, the Bible says, unto the woman, he say, said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So, the house is being formed, because it starts with the marriage, and who is the head of the house? It is the husband. And he shall rule over thee. What does it mean to be a ruler? First Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says, One that ruleth well his own house, this is talking about the, the qualifications of a bishop, and that should be a standard for every man in the church. So it's not just for the bishop. When I will not wear his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, what does it say? How shall he take care of the church of God? So ruling the church of God, or oh, the bishop, what does that mean? You're taking care of the church of God. You're the one in charge to take care of the church of God. That is... God is saying, if you can't do that in your own house, if you cannot rule your own house, that is, if you cannot take care of your own house. So what does it mean to rule? It's to be a benevolent dictator. You're taking care of your wife with knowledge. Dwell with her with knowledge, as the Bible says. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus is not waiting for the church to get say, uh, to uh, repent of their sins. Right? It was impossible. He had knowledge of the church. Well, I said church, that's the, uh, us, human beings. He had knowledge of human beings that we cannot stop sinning. I mean, from the beginning, God is like, evil continually is in his heart. I mean, let's just bless him. <laughs> like this, he had knowledge. And therefore, he came and died for our sins. Even while we are yet sin, as the Bible says. So, that understanding of, of your wife, you need it. Understand what she wants. How she wants you to express your love. Many women have it differently. Some women, you know, prefer words, some prefer different ways. You have to figure out your own wife, how she expects you to express your love. That is ruling your house, that is taking care of your house, giving her security in every aspect, financial security, uh, emotional security, everything. Giving her security in every aspect and not defrauding her in marriage. The ability to listen to the counsel of your wife. Abraham listened to Sarah. God told Abraham, listen to Sarah. <laughs> right? What was Sarah telling Abraham to do? To get rid of Ishmael. Send her away with her son. That was very difficult. Abraham loved Ishmael. Even when God was talking about Ishmael, Abraham was like, but save him. You know, but, but that he may leave. That Ishmael may leave, right? But he thought God was God, he thought God was going to kill Ishmael. So Abraham really loved Ishmael, but Sarah was saying, send him away with Hagar. Now, when Sarah advised Abraham to go into Hagar, did he think twice about that? The Bible doesn't record that. So it's not only when your wife is telling you what to put in your or oh, you, you just turn this basement into a man cave. That's the wife God gave me. You see? <laughs> you know, oh, let's, let's do your fantasies. It's not only when she advises you on your fantasies that you listen to her. Even the hard things. But according to what? The word of the Lord, because it's the house is the Lord that's built in the house. So God told Abraham, listen to your wife. So it's not all the time that the person that's calling you Lord is wrong. So your decisions should be for the betterment of your family. 
That's what it means to be a ruler. Now, a provider, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, as a, than an unbeliever. So, you should be a provider, you should be the spiritual leader, you should teach your wife, you should teach your children, Ephesians 6 verse 4, And you fathers, provoke not your, your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So as you should teach your children, you know, start with salvation at a very young age. Once they start to understand, that's the first thing, we're teaching them about salvation. Obviously about right and wrong, or don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, fine. But when, to start teaching them doctrine, start teaching them salvation. Salvation. Then they ask questions about other things they hear in church, that's fine. But teach them salvation and keep repeating it until you're sure that they're not just saying it, that they actually understand it and believe it. Then... Uh, you can count the last time that they didn't they answer the wrong thing, then that's when they really got saved. So teach them the fear of God. How do you teach them the fear of God? They should be sub, uh, in subjection to you with all gravity. If they don't fear you, they don't fear God. It's as simple as that. It, there's no two ways about it. Don't say, my child reads the Bible, but he doesn't obey me. He doesn't do anything I tell him to do. He doesn't fear God. He's just reading the Bible because you're there. Or he's just playing play the game. When he gets older, he's not going to fear God because he doesn't fear you. He doesn't have fear instilled in him. So he has to fear you first. And as I said, teach your wife because the wife should be silent in church and if she has any questions, she'll go ask her husband. So he's a spiritual leader. He's a priest as it were of the home. So um, he's a protector and I know we're all priests. Don't get me wrong. The women to are priests. We're all priesthood. I'm just saying, you know, he's, he's the leader. The, the person that everyone looks to Questions answered, leads in prayer, his spiritual leader. So he's a protector, right? He should be ready to put his life on the line. Physically, I'm not just saying spiritually or figuratively. Physically put his life on the line for his wife and his children. He's a comforter, he's a role model, I can go on and on. Let's look at the roles of the wife. She's to submit to her own husband. Ephesians 5.33, the Bible says, Nevertheless, every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence means to uh, have deep respect for your husband. What is the wife supposed to do? She's to manage or keep the house. Same thing, the housekeeper. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. So, as she's buying and keeping the house, remember, what is the first the beginning of the house? The beginning of your house is your marriage. So she should take care of her husband. That is the first thing. If not, we fall into that trap of the children are really running the house. There's a woman, as soon as they have the children, they forget about their husband. It's just, oh, it's the child. Oh, the child says, this child, the child. And the husband is, is neglected. I'm not saying that's an excuse for the husband to not do his duties. But I'm saying you're making it difficult because you're neglecting the fact that your duty is first to your husband. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32, the Bible says, But I would, uh, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cared for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Right? So you're building your house, you're not married, you're caring about the things of the law, that is your focus, you want to work and do everything you can in your youth, especially women. You're, you're, you're your teenagers, you're late teenagers, you're not yet married, do all the same things you can, <laughs> because the time will come when you cannot move from one place to another place without people trying to support you. <laughs> so do all the same things you can, do all that work. Because the childhood, giving birth, taking care of babies will come and you might not be able to do as much as you can. And the Bible goes on to say here in verse 33, But he that is married cared for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So, benevolent dictator, the married man, he cares about the things of the world to please his wife. He's providing, you know, everything that his wife needs. So he's taking care of his wife. Verse 34, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The married woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she that is married cared for the things of the world, how she may do what? Please her husband. Now, so yes, she's supposed to please her husband. And you have at least nine months, at least, it could be more, most likely more, you have nine months after you're married to be dedicated to his care, to the things that he wants, everything that he wants. Now, when the baby comes and the babies start coming, your attention is divided, and rightfully so. Your attention is divided, and then there's a the time for everything. <laughs> right? There's a the time for everything. So you say, oh, she doesn't care about me. There's time for everything. Look, look, if the baby's crying, she's not sleeping, 
obviously, you, you have to dwell with her with understanding, with knowledge, as the Bible says. So, I'm not going to digress so much into that. Let's move on. Uh, open to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. As we open there, I read you 1 Timothy 5.14. So, please your husband, and I'm sure your husband will be pleased if you're taking care of the children. So, please your husband. 1 Timothy 5.14, the Bible says, I read therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give no occasion to your adversary to speak reproachfully. So, don't give occasion to the world to speak reportedly about the word of God. Oh, see how the women are, see what the family is. No, because women are doing what? Guiding the house. Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 3, you're there, the Bible says, The age, aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, see, please your husband, love your husband, that's the first thing, the foundation of building the house. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, that is like holy and separated unto your husband. Chaste, keep us at home, good, obedience to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So the adversary will not speak reproachfully. It's the same thing, it's a parallel passage. So this is a blessing for women, oh, to be keepers at home, to manage the house, that is to have children and manage your house, to have a husband, all of that. That is a blessing for women. Bible says in Psalm 113, if you can open there, go fast with me because of time. Psalm 113, verse 7. 113, verse 7. The Bible says, He raised up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Let's pause here. So, what is this psalm saying right now, or this passage I just read? He he's raising the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill. So from the lowest of the low, for a man, what is the highest? The lowest of the low out of the dunghill, out of the dust, to set him with the princes, that's the rulers of his people. So and and I, I'm not saying the highest of the highest to be the president. <laughs> this is in Israel, right? In the, in the place of God, where the house of God is. So it is like being a, a great in the kingdom of God. Right? So it's not well, you have to shoot to be a president or something in this land. Uh, so it's from the laws of the law to be ruler at the gate, like to be with the princes of his people. Now, how about the woman? Verse 9 He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. So what's the law of the law of the woman? Barrenness, right? So she's married, no children, and all of that. So it's kind of low. Then God will bless her. What is the height? No, uh, to keep house, to have children, but want to keep house to be the joyful mother of children. So, from low to high. You say, oh, that's not a blessing. It is a blessing. That's what the, the psalmist is teaching us. So, it's a blessing to keep house. That's what God is blessing you as women. That is the, the way, that is the job, except the word beauty house. That is how God wants your house to be built. So, imagine your home is like a company, it's like a firm. The husband is the CEO. This is just a parable, it doesn't apply in all situations. The husband is the CEO, the chief executive officer. The woman is the managing director. But guess what? She does everything. She's the chef, she's the cook, same thing. She's the uh, maid, she's the teacher, she's everything. I mean, she's, she runs the house. The daily running of the house, the day-to-day -day concerns of the house is her duty. The husband just gives the go. So we need to make profits of 15% from last year or something. And that's it. Anyhow you get to do it, you do it. Now, if you're not meeting that goal, you need to let me know. So, do I need to reject funds? Do I need to, you know, like, th that's what the husband does. Now, he has to understand the process, obviously, and he has to give his advice. So, that's why it's not just a woman that doesn't know anything. A foolish woman, a dumb woman, that will just run the house. If a dumb woman is running the house, the house is going to be run to the ground. That's why the Bible says there's a woman that uses her own hands to destroy her house. Anyway. Uh, as the CEO, yeah, he's advising, he's talking about decisions in the house, how realistic, how feasible they are. So the, the mother or the wife is advising the CEO about that. The types of goals they can meet. The surprise profits they get, if she's a virtuous woman, as the Bible says. So the woman, the wife, you're the main homeschool teacher in the house. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. The Bible says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest 
in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, the man cannot do all these things literally. He can ensure that he's going in his house because God will hold him responsible, but he cannot do all these things every time, every day, because he's going to work. He has to work in the field. So this is homeschool. Homeschool is a way of life. It's the normal way of life. It, it had a name because of public school. Right. <laughs> but it, it was just, oh, yeah, I'm raising my children. Right. That's homeschool. I'm raising my children. But when they brought out public school, then they now gave raising children without public school a name. Right. Homeschool. <laughs> but it, it should be a way of life. Everything in, as you raise your children is, is homeschool, not just the academics. You say, oh, because sometimes people just focus on the academics. They teach, they teach their children math, English, and all, okay, we finish school. That's it. That's, that's not even the half of it. <laughs> in fact, that is not even the main thing. The main thing is God. Right. And living and writing. That's the main thing. If you can read and write, I'm sorry, if you know God, <laughs> right? That is that quoting Bible before you learn how to read the Bible, that's good. Not just quoting Bible, having knowledge of God and fear of God. So, and they can read and write, they're set. They can teach themselves anything. Yeah. And no more than those are going to school. Yeah. They already start learning like in college. Because in public school, you're just doing whatever they tell you to do. You manage past the SATs. When you go to college, you have to teach yourself. The teacher just comes in, everyone's playing, people are talking. The teacher just comes in, oh yeah, this is what we're doing. We're going to read this chapter, and um, these are the homeworks. Now, do you have any questions on this? I'll solve this problem here, they'll solve 2 plus 2, and they'll give you minus x plus, like, in the test. You have to teach yourself. <laughs> and nobody wants to ask questions. That is, the whole school students are already like that. They teach themselves. The children just give them a book, and they're just going to ask the questions they don't know of. They're ready to learn more. So that is more than academics, what I'm trying to say. Don't just say, oh, there's a whole summer break. Summer break doing what? What do you do? They're not being raised. Oh, there's a time in the year when you don't raise your children. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> so the whole year for us, I mean, people do it differently. Don't get me wrong. There are different methods you want to do, but there should be some established things. Even when they have breaks, the word of God. Reading and writing, just simple things. Uh, don't just always follow the way of the world. The world should not dictate how you run your house. Right. Oh, it's snow today, so there's no school. Oh, yeah, you guys can play in no school in, at home. <laughs> so it makes sense. <laughs> you see, so uh, the, the wife is doing all these things. The husband is in the field and he's, he's not much concerned because he has given that authority and charge to the wife. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 verse 15, the word and reproof give wisdom, guess what, look at the next thing, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Right. Open to 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 17. Why is he bringing the mother to shame? Because the father is walking in the field, the mother is supposed to be keeping the house, but the child is left to himself. You see that? So he's, he's being a shame. He's, he's a shame. I'm supposed to be keeping them. I'm supposed to be taking care of them. And when they arise, they go with me. When I see it, when I go grocery shopping, everything I'm doing in the house, they're supposed to be with me and they're supposed to be learning. But they are left alone by themselves. It's a shame to the mother because she keeps the house. The, uh, the story in 2 Kings chapter 4 is the story of the child of the Shunammite woman that Elisha prayed for and she got, gave birth and all of that. Then you know the story how the child died and she, was, she ran back to Elisha saying it is well, it is well. Just, let's just read one part of the story here, a few verses. Bible says in verse 17, 2 Kings 4, 17, And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on the day that he went out to his father to the reapers. That means he went to work with his father. That means the child is weaned, the child is old enough to go to work with the father. So he fell on that day that he was supposed to go. That means maybe it's not every day he goes because he's still young. So the day that he went out with his father, let's keep reading. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said, as the father said to the lad, there's another lad that's there. Carry him to his mother. <laughs> He's not too much concerned about the day today. I don't know what he ate yesterday. I don't know if he didn't sleep well. Just take him to his mother. That's all. Now, I don't think the father knew that the boy was going to die. <laughs> now, if the boy was going to die, he would have, you know, gone with the boy. It's not that he didn't care about his son. The point is, the running of the house, how what clothes is wearing, all those things. The mother handles all of that. So he's walking to care for his house, right, to provide for his own, 
He's not going to disturb. He's going to child saying, my head, my head. Just deal with that. Just take him to his mother. I can't deal with that. <laughs> I mean, he's just he's having a small headache. You know, I'm just trying to train him. So take him to his mother. John and Lord are dying. <laughs> but I'm just trying to point out, now it's a story. It's not that God says, anytime your child says, my head, my head, you send him to his mother. <laughs> The story where I'll show you the uh, the lifestyle, right? And the righteous home, to the best of my knowledge. So uh, let's move on. The roles of a child, or the roles of children. Open to Ephesians chapter six. It's straightforward. In Ephesians chapter six, summarized: children are to submit to their parents. Children, are you listening? Obey, obey your father and mother. Bible says, in, I was going to read it. Ephesians six verse one: Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That's simple. Just do whatever daddy and mommy tells you to do. You are blessed to be attending a church like this, or like the generations who in the judges where there's a generation that rose up that knew not the Lord so you're raised in this church you're bringing you to church you're learning from the Bible and you, you have a blessed home so guess what God is going to require much from you God is going to require much from you He requires you to be a good child just like Timothy that knew the Lord when he was young now when he grew older he did great things for the Lord God is expecting that from you also to, to, to be a great vessel of honor to the Lord. It starts and ends with listening to your parents. Obey your parents. Do what you know is right. You don't, you don't, don't assume, right? Don't guess. Don't say, you know, I thought this is what you meant. See, if you don't know, ask. Mommy, what should I do? Daddy, is this right? Should I do this? Ask. Listen to the instructions of your father and the laws of your mother, as the Bible says. So do what you know is right, then grow in knowledge. So now that you know that this is the right thing to do at that time, don't just do it absent mindedness. Like store that knowledge. Grow precept upon precept. You know, line upon line, little here, little there. So fear your parents and let because Luke 19 3 says, You shall fear every man, his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. So fear your parents. Strive to please them. Fear the Lord. Don't want to displease your parents. God is always watching. Because you can trick your parents. I will not be everywhere. Mom is not going to be everywhere at every time. You can trick them. You can deceive them. But know that God is watching. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 11, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. So everyone too is watching. We know by your doings. If it is right or if it is wrong. Because you are part of the house. And this is how God wants the house to be built. The parents are doing their part, you have to do your own part too. So it takes a lot of work to build a physical house. Talk less of your family. Talk less of the house. Your own house that God is building. Which is a greater house. I mean, your family is greater than the house you live in. I don't care what kind of house you live in. Your family is greater than it. And except the Lord build your own house, it is all vanity. No matter what house you're living in, no matter what system you set up, it is all vanity. Every member must submit to the will of God and His commandments. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 3 5 Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Oh, I've, I, I know about how to raise a family, I've read all the books. You know, this is what she's supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what no, no, no. It's what God wants you to do. So find out the will of God for your life. But it says, in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil, and it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. In building the house, prepare to fight the enemies. You see, you have, you have, you have to do the work with Him. Then there are external forces that are against you. Open to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17. Judah, where, uh, the Jews were rebuilding Jerusalem walls. They were rebuilding Jerusalem after they were sent back and they were being fought against. They were attacked on every side. And this is how they proceeded to build the house that God told them to build. Right? So God was preaching to them and told them through Haggai and Zechariah that they should go back, contribute in the house of the Lord, and finish up Jerusalem. The Bible says in verse 17, They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens, 
with, uh, with those that uh, loaded every one with his uh, every one of every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon for the builders every one had his sword girded by his side and so builded and he that sounded the trumpet was by me and I said unto the nobles unto the rulers unto the rest of the people the work is great and large and we are separated upon the wall one far from another in what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet resort ye thither unto us our God shall fight for us so we labored in the work and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared what am I trying to say they are ready to attack the enemy they are ready to fight because there are enemies all around so prepare to fight you're building one hand with one weapon one hand with a tool <laughs> and you're building your house according to how God wants you to build it see the devil will not sit idle as you build your house he's trying from everywhere to destroy your marriage he's trying from everywhere to destroy your children right <laughs> Tempting you every temptation is all the wiles of the devil. Don't be ignorant of the wiles of the devil and you fall into the trap because it's you that can destroy yourself. Oh, Jerusalem, thou has destroyed thyself, right? Be ready to fight. Fight for your marriage. Conquer the enemies within and without. Fight for your children. Don't lose them to the world. They have an agenda to get your children. And contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. You know, stay in the fight with your church. Bring them to church. Fight, do the work of God. That is what it takes to build your house. Because it is your spiritual family. Right? So, the blessings, the, the church is a blessing for your house and a reward for your house. It's a, the church is a gift for your house, as the Bible says. So, don't be afraid to rebuild from desolations, which is what they were doing. Jerusalem was desolated and they still built it back according to the word of the Lord. So, after the house of God was destroyed due to sin, Right? Judah said, God restored them from captivity, and they called upon his name and returned unto him, and they built the house of the Lord. Open to Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. Ezra 3, verse 10. Then God commanded them to rebuild the, the house of the Lord, and it was, it was very challenging. So it's better to stay right than to get right. There are many things in your house that are right, keep them right. Now, those that are not right, build them back from desolations according to the word of God. Whether it's your marriage, whether it's your children, build them back. If your marriage started with lust, start building back with love. Because you don't come out of the covenant. Right? If there's chaos in your house with your children, then introduce the staff and thy word and comfort them. <laughs> in every sense of the word. The staff and the word introduce them to them uh, introduce that to them so in Ezra chapter 3 verse 10 let me read you this passage there at the end of chapter 3 the Bible says and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord they set the priests in the apparel with trumpets and the Levites the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David king of Israel and they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid but many of the priests and Levites the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off why were the ancient men weeping they, I, I believe maybe it's because it was not too much to be compared with the first house because the first house, the Thomas temple that was built, I mean, even in the place where they were, they were building it, there was no noise. All the noise happened for outside. The cutting of the trees, the, the hewing of the stone, everything did happen without the, the location of the building. And they only brought the pieces together and just put them together. There's, there's no noise making. It was just wonderful. So these ancient men, they looked and they were like, Wow. I mean, it is great. I'm sure they were rejoicing, but it's nothing to be compared. Now, even if that's not what it was, even if they're looking at it like, wow, the temple is back again. That is what it means to be from desolations. Don't think it is too late, or I cannot build the house back. Look at what God said in Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, concerning that house, because God was preaching to them through Haggai, or presenting to them through Haggai, and 
Zechariah, and he told them in verse 9, chapter 2, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. Don't say, oh, no, I don't want to do, do rebuild. You know, I just, I just want to just end it all. My marriage is not working out. I'm ending it all. My children, I'm just going to give up. No, rebuild. And the glory could be greater. He said, how is glory at this temple greater? This is the temple that Jesus walked into. He didn't walk into Solomon's temple. But this is the temple he walked into. That just gives it a status right there. <laughs> that is, it's a greater temple. Just with that alone, in my own opinion. So, no matter what you're rebuilding uh, from desolations, rebuild it. And God will glorify it. Whether it's your marriage, your children, your service for the Lord, because that's part of building your house. Your service for the Lord, even your secular job. You know, find work. God requires it of us. Right? So, build with the blueprint of the Lord. In conclusion, the Lord's blueprint is an ideal. That is the ideal. What are we supposed to do? Aim for the ideal. I know we live in this present world. It's not, uh, there are exceptions. Everyone is a different situation, different circumstance. That's okay. Always aim for the ideal that you know is in your power. And you are made to do good and do it not. It is seen to him. Somebody else might not be able to do that. Okay, it might not be seen to them. For example, if your, your parents, this is, I'm just came to my head, but your parents sent you uh, to another country for school. Okay, you cannot live with your parents at that point. <laughs> so it's not the ideal. You want to live in your father's house until you get married. That's the ideal. But if that's not the ideal, then it is what it is. Your parents sent you away from a bad situation, moving to a better country or a better place for, for school or for something else. You have to obey your parents in that situation. So that's just one example. Um, but if you can aim for the ideal, always aim to do what is in your power. And don't treat those that are living the ideal with contempt with envy right don't you uh, because somebody has a, a good life and is living the idea that god wants him to live then you treat them with hatred or envy no that is wrong and don't propagate the less than ideal don't propagate it even that even if it's your life just keep quiet right the example is you're not homeschooling then you're talking about how nice public school is Oh, my, my kid, you know, they had a, their friends came over and they had this. Oh, I couldn't send my kids to that. Oh, oh now they have this, they're calling his class to the White House. He's like, why are you telling us? <laughs> that is not the idea. So don't propagate and talk about how nice public school is. Or, you know, I just, you know, this is my second marriage. God just blessed me. I mean, the second time is the charm. No, sorry, the third, this is my third marriage. You know, the third, the third time is a charm. You know, like, he's a wonderful man. Well, do you know this is my third marriage? Like, <laughs> we don't need to lose your third marriage. Like, just, you're married. Okay, just move on. Because that is, don't propagate what is not the ideal. Okay? And, the, you know, the, if you married the right way, like, maybe your husband died, okay, that's fine. But if it's the wrong way, God will punish you for your sins in his own way. You just pray for mercy, but continue as Jesus told the woman with her fifth husband. Okay, <laughs> that's your fifth husband. Just continue your life that way, as if it's your first husband. And then we're talking about, oh, this is my fifth husband. She she wasn't. She didn't want to mention that fact that it was her fifth husband. All right. So let's move on. Do your part to ensure your house is built by the Lord. The roles of the husband, the roles of the wife. Even the children, because even a child is known by his doings, whether his will be right or whether they be pure. So do your part to ensure that your house is built by the Lord. Don't fail to do your part because others are not fulfilling their part. You know, my wife is not submitting. So therefore, you're not going to take care of your house. You're not going to rule. Instead, you want to abuse your authority. Oh, my husband is not a loving husband. He doesn't know how to love you. Oh, therefore, you're not going to keep the house. You're not going to submit to him. Therefore, you're not submitting to the Lord. Right? Your, your children do not fear you or obey you. So you're just going to leave them to their devices. At the end, you suffer. Everything you're doing, you're doing it unto the Lord. Because He's the one building the house. Right? So anything else you do is vanity. Except the Lord build the house. The labor in vain that build it. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about the house. Now we are building. Uh, the men were the good men of the house. But it's a house that if you do not build, we are building in vain. 
Help us, O oh Lord, to follow your blueprint. Help us, O oh Lord, to play our roles. And um, let us not look down on any other's roles. And let us support ourselves in our families and thereby the church because the church is made up of families. So the house is our family. That it bless our families, increase us, and the desires that we have, we have, let our ways delight you so that you can order our steps. Thank you, Lord, for this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.